I cannot do Saturn's rings justice on this board. It just can't be done. I encourage you to not only look at this figure here in your textbook on page 294 that I'm trying to sort of reproduce here, uh, figure 1211, but go online and uh, Google Saturn's rings. The Wikipedia page has a love, some lovely pictures of the details of these rings and they're just mind-blowing uh, the the complexity of them and the structure of them as you look closer and closer at them. We'll say what they are in just a minute but first I want to give you a little road map to Saturn's rings. Um, there really are actually just literally millions of them but they are grouped into these major groups that were you know first identified a uh, number of more you know, well more than a century ago and um, there's really six. I didn't draw one of the six on here. Um, I don't want to take up the space. But basically, going from the inside to the outside, the darkest major ring is called the D-ring. And I, this cross-hatching, I've tried to make them brighter as they move outward from Saturn. This is Saturn, the, this, the body of the planet itself, sort of looking down from the pole. D is the darker ring. I try to indicate that by cross-hatching it very lightly. And as we go to the C ring and the B ring, they get brighter and brighter. And then there's this huge gap between the B and A rings known as the Cassini division. Now we can't see this with our Galileo scopes, but with a slightly larger telescope you can see the Cassini division. It is very obvious for any picture you see of Saturn. Uh, online, you're gonna the Cassini division just gonna jump out at you, and then the brightest ring of all, the brightest major ring of all, is called the A ring, and it's right outside the Cassini division. So this is a blank spot where there are no rings. The Cassini division is, but on the other side of that, you get the A ring, which is the brightest of all of them. And again, I've tried to indicate that on the drawing here. It's not easy to do. On the outer edge of the A ring is a little bitty gap, and it's been hard, to, sort of hard to draw in the picture here. It's known as the Inky, let me write that to where you can, not I-N-K-Y, Inky, nope, but E-N-C-K-E, -E. gap, okay, and that is within the A-ring. The A-ring was identified before the Inky gap was discovered, and so there's a thin little opening, okay, a thin little gap in the A-ring right near the outer edge of it, okay. I don't know how that comes out on the painting there, but there is a gap there. And if you look at look at your textbook, look at this figure here, you'll be able to see the inky gap. And then there's a larger gap between the uh, A ring and a very thin, actually braided. It's beautiful. It's amazing when you look at the structure of the F ring. But the F ring itself is, is there's a large gap of maybe several hundred, maybe even a thousand kilometers. And then there's this long, beautifully braided F ring. Okay, and of course these go all the way around the planet here. I just uh, done a little, uh, just a little section of them here. Uh, outside the F ring, way out here, and I don't want to draw because I don't want to take up space. But out here, there's an E ring. If you're wondering where E went, okay, there's an E ring out here. We'll talk about the E ring uh, in the next video, but not this one. But there is a, a, a sixth major ring known as the E ring, and the F and E rings were discovered uh, after the AB. C and D rings were. So that's kind of the, the roadmap to the rings. But if you look up at any one of these rings, uh, A, B, C, D, whatever, you'll start to see that they are composed of thousands upon thousands of thinner, more highly structured rings within these. This is just the broadest possible picture. There are rings within rings within rings. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you know what the word fractal means, but uh, the rings sort of approach what is called in mathematics a fractal structure, which is really, really fascinating. So that's kind of the overall, uh, overall uh, structure of Saturn's rings. Now, what I want to address in the next five or ten minutes is where we think these rings came from. Okay, well, a couple of things to say is that um, we do think that the rings have not always been there, nor do we think the rings will always be there. Some might be older than others. Uh, it's not clear that they're all the same age. 
but uh, it is clear to us that the rings are not a stable, permanent part of Saturn. If you had looked at Saturn maybe uh, 100 million years ago, which sounds like a long time to us, but in the history of the solar system, that's very, very tiny, tiny fraction of the total time. Um, if you just look between 50 and 100 million years ago, either the rings would either not be there at all, or they would be very different looking. And it might also be that some other planets had more prominent rings. Even Mars maybe had rings that long ago. So rings we think are a come, some they come and go. Okay. Um, now, what are the rings made of? Before I tell you where we think they came from, it's important to say what they're made of. They're made of tiny particles of ice. That is H2O frozen. Small particles. They're not solid. I mean, I mean, the, the rings themselves are not solid individual things. They're not liquid. They are made up of tiny little pieces of ice. Okay. When I say the rings aren't solid, I don't mean that they're I don't mean that they're not composed of solid things. I'm saying that they themselves are not just solid continuous bands. If you looked up close to them, you would see they were made of tiny particles of ice. Okay, that are pretty well separated from each other, but are highly reflective. Ice is highly reflective, so that's why they shine so much. That's why they're so obvious, because they're highly reflective. They have a high albedo. I don't know if you've come across that word in um, your reading or not. I suspect you have. Albedo means reflectivity. Okay. A high albedo means they reflect a lot. A low albedo is something darker uh, that reflects very little. So they have a high albedo. That's also, by the way, a pretty good name for your next pet, albedo. Um, so where do they come from? Well, we're not sure, uh, but we have some ideas. And in order to let you know what those ideas are, I want to revisit this idea of tidal forces. Okay, and let's say we have a large massive body here. Okay, let's say this is Saturn with no rings. Okay, say Saturn has no rings. Imagine Saturn without rings. It's hard to do, but try to do it. Okay, just the sphere part without the ring part. And now let's say that we bring in a little moon or maybe a comet, some object, okay, made of ice. All, out, all of the moons of the outer solar system, virtually all the moons of the outer solar system, and all comets are made of ice. So ice is abundant in the outer, outer solar system. So it's not too much uh, to suppose that we have a small ice moon. Okay. Now if we bring that moon in closer, I should probably draw this a little bit bigger. I'm going to draw that moon a little bit bigger. Okay. It's not to scale with Saturn. As we bring that closer in, it's going to be pulled tidally. It's going to be stretched out, kind of like the tides on the Earth are stretched out into a football shape. It's going to get stretched out more and more as it comes closer and closer and closer to Saturn. The tidal forces, the effect of tidal forces on an object is to stretch it. The tidal forces of the moon kind of stretch the ocean out into a football shape, right? It's not spherical anymore. The point closest to the moon gets pulled towards it. The point furthest from the moon gets pulled least strongly, so it gets pulled into a football shape. At some point, as you bring this ice moon in, or this comet, whatever, again, it could be a comet or a moon, whatever, as you bring it closer in, eventually it's going to shatter and break up into a, t a thousand tiny little pieces, actually more like billions of tiny little pieces. The point at which that happens is a limit surrounding the planet known as the Roche limit. Within the Roche limit, a moon or a comet cannot exist without being fractured and, sh and shredded by tidal forces. Okay. Saturn's rings, except for the F ring, all lie within Saturn's Roche limit. If the planet Saturn has a radius of R, planet 
radius r, then the Roche limit is about 2.4 r. For example, the Earth has a, 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 a radius of about 4,000 miles. The Roche limit is about 2.4 about times larger than that. So for the Earth, R is about, is about 4,000 miles, but the Earth's Roche limit is about 9,600 miles from the center of the Earth. That's about 2.4 times the Earth's radius. If we were to bring the moon, our own moon, within that distance of the Earth, the moon would shatter. It would not be able to keep itself in a spherical shape. It would shatter into a thousand pieces. So the idea is that the, is that the rings of Saturn are probably composed of the remnants, the shattered remnants of a comet or moon that came too close. If this sounds like an odd or fantastic occurrence, I assure you it's not. It wasn't too long ago, back in the mid-90s, sounds like a long time ago to you, but I was in graduate school. Uh, in the mid-90s, a uh, comet struck Jupiter, and we got to watch it shatter into a billion pieces. Now, its orbit was such that all, virtually all of its pieces fell into Jupiter and basically you know, exploded upon impact because of the friction. Very dramatic, very exciting moment for us astronomy geeks. But the point is, is that ice bodies like comets or moons being shattered by tidal forces is not uncommon. And we believe that the most likely explanation for the source of Saturn's rings was some event like that where an ice comet or moon, an icy comet or moon, was shattered by Saturn's gravity. And maybe was uh, not falling straight into Saturn, but maybe had a, you know, maybe was coming in at an angle and so its pieces didn't fall straight into Saturn but ended up orbiting around it. Okay. Now, how these, uh, moon, how these rings got so flat, right? they're hundreds of thousands of miles side to side, but they're only about a few miles thick, even, if not even, that, not even that much. Probably like, you know, maybe, maybe a less than, I can't remember now off the top of my head. It's really thin, probably even less than a mile. Thick. Uh, how they got so thin, that's a, that's a discussion they cover in the textbook, but I can't cover here in lecture. Um, but there is a physical mechanism that would definitely cause these rings to flatten out over time. But anyway, we think that that's what caused the rings, and also we think that the rings are leaking. They're losing little, these little particles all the time. And they're, very, they're not massive at all. The total mass of the rings is very, 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 very small, consistent with the idea that it was an icy moon or comet uh, that shattered. I think that's it for this particular video. Next up, the, moon, uh, the moons of Saturn. Uh, yeah, the uh, thickness of the rings is about 10 miles. I lost that number a second ago. I said one mile, that's not right. It's about 10 miles thick, which, you know, sounds like a long way. You know, one side of 285 to the other. But compared to the size of the rings, hundreds of thousands of miles across, that's nothing. See you in video 49, where we'll talk about the moons of Saturn, which are easily as amusing as Saturn's rings.